Hello and welcome back to the ninth session in our little series on, on the story of the church. We're going to move now from the church fathers and the way they went about their business of doing theology and especially their reflections on the church. We're going to move to uh, a new era, a new way of doing theology and thinking about things and it's known as the scholastic age, a very important age for our understanding of theology even today. Now I have to begin by telling you that the scholastics didn't always have much to say about the church per se, and there isn't a huge development therefore in, in how they understood the church. Uh, that's true of the content, but in terms of the method, the way they understood every aspect of theology was very different to the church fathers. Another thing to highlight in this particular historical period uh, are some other developments that were taking place generally, one could say, beyond theological reflection and especially the relationship between the church and the state, if you will, the ecclesial and the secular. So with those little aspects in mind, let's go now to thinking about things further. You know, I often come across people who think there was a golden age in the history of the church. And I think once again, we have to confront that and say, in fact, was there ever such a time? I've already mentioned in this series, the words of St. Basil of Caesarea, who talked about the church on the eve of the council of Nicaea and uh, quoted by the theologian, Joseph Ratzinger in his book, Principles of Catholic theology. But I could mention another saint, one nearer to home for us, who four centuries later said something very similar. This is uh, Saint Boniface, who was originally an English monk in Exeter and became a missionary bishop in Mainz, restoring and founding new dioceses in Bavaria, Thuringia and Franconia. He was a great evangelist and was eventually martyred in Friesland, modern day Holland, in 754. And echoing the imagery of Saint Basil of Caesarea, Saint Boniface wrote these words in a letter. He said, the church is like a great ship sailing the sea of the world and tossed by the waves of temptation in this life but it is not to be abandoned, it must be brought under control. And you could say that the work of the scholastics was part of that bringing under control. So what was going on at that particular time? Well, the church's relationship with the rest of society certainly changed when the uh, Emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity and there began to be something known as the Constantinian settlement. In other words, a new relationship between the church and society, no longer persecuted by the Roman Empire anyway. There were still challenges. The church had to uh, negotiate a new relationship with civic authorities. And the medieval Charlemagne for example, saw himself and his office as the emperor to be the head of the church precisely because he exercised sovereign power over the body of Christians who constituted the church. And his legal developments included the regulations of ecclesiastical matters. Now, after the time of Charlemagne, the bishops uh, clawed back their authority, so to speak, all under the universal authority of the Bishop of Rome. 
So we could say that the Constantinian settlement uh, actually created Christendom's complicated religious and political identity for the next millennium. In 1302, Boniface, Boniface VIII published Unum Sanctum, which declared the whole world was under two swords, spiritual and temporal, and both, this Pope said, were on, ultimately under papal authority. To understand Unam Sanctum, it is important to reflect upon Mark 12, 17 and Matthew 22, 21, familiar texts to all of us, I'm sure, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, Jesus said, and to God what belongs to God. Boniface later explains, we declare that in no way do we wish to usurp the jurisdiction of the king, and yet neither the king nor anyone else of the faithful can deny that he is subject to us where a question of sin is involved. And at the heart of that statement is the idea that the church mediates grace to the world. This is an early articulation of a truth that would be spoken of even more fully in the Second Vatican Council's document on the church, Lumen Gentium. In Article 48 of Lumen Gentium, the church is called the universal sacrament of salvation. St. Thomas Aquinas uh, is the source of the final line of Unum Sanctum. In Thomas's hands, the line is simply intended to equate membership in the church with submission to the pontiff. And, and uh, I, I won't go into all the detail of that uh, background, but simply to say that there is something emerging, therefore, which is indeed theological um, and not just a political reality. Something else to consider, by the middle of the ninth century, the great divorce between the East and the West was well underway. And this was reflected in the respective ways in which the East and the West understood the Church. The Catholic Church became increasingly Western and Latin. So the relationship between the Church and the State has continued to be an area of discussion and challenge even to the present day. Under Gregory VII, the power of popes was clearly defined and Charlemagne's understanding of things was all but over in the medieval period. Basically, the church's understanding was that the pope was appointed by God and in fact had the power to depose kings if they interfered with the church and what the church believed to be her divine rights. This is very important for us here in the Diocese of Northampton because our patron, of course, is St. Thomas Becket, someone who uh, plays out the tension within um, Pope Boniface's understanding of the church in his relationship with King Henry II. So the church also has a, a relationship with society um, which is independent in terms of spirituality. And what we begin to see even in this time is the beginning of what we now know as secularization. There is the messy business of worldly power exercised by the church from the level of the popes to local bishops and abbots. This, my dear friends, did not serve us well, as I'm sure you would agree with me. The expression of an ecclesiological understanding was certainly ripe for renewal. Now, before we talk about the scholastics uh, and their way of doing things, I just want to make a quotation from Hans Urs von Balthasar. I think I've already told you that he's one of my favorite theologians. And he says this, whatever is merely put in storage, handed down without any fresh efforts being made on one's own part, putrefies like the manna did. 
and the longer the living tradition has been broken through purely mechanical repetition, the more difficult it may become to renew it. This is certainly not about intellectual fashion in the modern sense of the word, but in obedience to theology's own dynamic, remaining open to the insights of the Holy Spirit, uh, who would have us appreciate at a particular time in church's history what is happening, what God is doing amongst us. Nothing brings so much harm, von Balthasar writes, in its train as the failure to appreciate an historical context. It is bound adversely to affect the theology of the present. And so we come to the scholastic period and its new synthesis of faith and reason. This could be described as the move from the objective to the subjective viewpoint, the move from allegory, much beloved by the early church fathers, particularly in the way that they understood scriptures, to the medieval idea of analogy. And what happened is that from the time of the early church fathers, theology and spirituality were considered to be a, a single enterprise, right up in fact until the 12th century, uh, before the development of theology taking place in the schools, which later evolved into universities. Now this is not to deny that there was a certain diversity of approach in different times and places, but it did highlight the essential integrity of the relationship between spirituality and theology in that early period. So theology encompassed sermons, rules, letters and the lives of saints all within the context of prayerful reflection. Prayer inspired and incorporated intelligent study of a lived out faith within the church. And during the, the, de, uh, the period that we are thinking about, the definition of a theo theologian um, was quite simple, someone who reflected upon the history of salvation and who contemplated their own experience of faith. The word of God was central to this integrated theology that prevailed from late antiquity until the last quarter of the 12th century. This is something which is prayerful and contemplative rather than scientific. A theology that later distinguished the monasteries from the schools. It continued in the monasteries, this contemplative reflection of the sacred page. And this marked the theology from the early church fathers down to Peter Abelard, who lived towards the end of the 11th century and the first part of the 12th. It's the way of theology that was followed by post-apostolic times to the time of St. Bernard of Clairvaux in the 11th and 12th centuries. And throughout that uh, early period of the church, theology was considered to be a very powerful journey into the word of God, expressing it in the liturgy and in prayer. It was always conducted under the belief that the deeper the insight one had into the word of God, the more understanding could be gained for all aspects of Christian life within the community of the church. And that sets the stage for a very different way of understanding things. So scholasticism in the Western church began in the 11th century and um, there is never a dull moment in church history. At that particular time, there were uh, some, some very interesting things going on, uh, which must have been very exciting at the time. In particular, the development of some lay-led movements, uh, which really wanted to um, return to the gospel simplicity of the apostolic times. That's what they wanted, but in fact they were challenging not only in their practices, but in their 
beliefs. And they were um, reacting to what they perceived to be the uh, growing power of hierarchical structures within the church. Of course, there was another reaction to what was happening with the emergence of new religious orders, um, religious and clerical uh, in, in the life of the Dominicans, for example, and the Franc Franciscans and the Carmelites. So nearly one and a half centuries later, scholasticism came under the influence of St. Thomas Aquinas. But the church was seen very much from the perspective of Christ. The church was considered by Aquinas to be the mystical body of Christ and he describes Christ as the head of the church. Until then the mystical body referred more to a Eucharistic understanding of the body of Christ. But scholasticism was able to also inherit from Saint Augustine the spirit-sensed perspective that the church is spirit-filled and so the church was understood to be the con congregation of believers united through Christ in faith and together with being the body of Christ animated by the Holy Spirit. There were challenges all through this period between the papacy and secular rulers together with the emergence of these new lay movements that I've already mentioned uh, and all of this shaping the scholastic understanding of the church. That was the context for their theological reflection about the body of Christ. If uh, St. Augustine's contemplative theological method was based on the journey from faith to understanding, there is a sense in which the scholastics turned this upside down. They were a posteriori in their approach rather than a priori. And this was supposed, supported by an Aristotelian philosophy rather than a Platonic one. A rational approach to truth which began with the evidence of the senses and natural phenomena to an understanding of truths beyond the grasp of the senses. In other words, intellige ut credas, understand that you may believe. We see the first signs of this approach in the work of Boethius, a great philosopher and a thinker who did not ignore what had gone before in the Church Fathers and in the way that they did their work. He tried to bring together the Platonic world of essences and Aristotle's focus on the world of particular realities. Pseudo Dionysius built upon those foundations and in particular introduced the idea of hierarchy into scholastic thinking. This means that not every idea or theory or doctrine is equal. There is a, a hierarchy of importance in what we are thinking and teaching and believing. And this, according to one thinker in the 20th century, reflecting upon the work of Boethius and Pseudo Dionysius, said it shattered the metaphysical scheme which locked up each nature within its own ontological perimeter. In order to create the bridge then between faith and reason and nature and grace, the scholastics developed the notion of analogy. This enabled faith to become rooted in an authentic system of human thought. The axiom grace builds upon nature is an idea which will be very helpful when we consider the theological changes of the Pro Protestant Reformation. During the scholastic era, theological reflection became something for academic specialists rather than for every Christian. And the vehicle for this development was the introduction of the universities. Philosophical reason became more than a useful tool for theological reflection. 
in the universities, it became the means for well-ordered structuring of the elements of belief. One problem with all this is that we now have the beginning of theological differentiation and specialization. So for the early church fathers, there was a delightful unity between theological reflection. Now, if you think about the church, you might be doing that, but not in harmony necessarily with thinking about scripture or thinking about um, uh, moral theology uh, or, or thinking about other doctrinal topics. Theology clearly then has the potential to lose its sense of integrity and the overall vision that it had in the patristic age. To be fair, Boethius had differentiated two methods at work in theology, the reasonable method of the academic theologians and the contemplative method which is concerned with direct experience of the divine. Another element of the scholastics within the university setting is found in the systematic presentation of theology in what is known as uh, the Sentences, a work by Peter Lombard. And this is far more than a commentary on scripture. It was a bringing together and a summary of what the church fathers had said about a number of theological areas and so deepening that sense of differentiation. Peter Abelard took the matter further. In the relationship between faith and reason, he is quite clearly beginning with reason. Questiones naturales is a scientific investigation using reason and logic. And this is developed further in Questio with the introduction of theological questioning in the reconciliation of different authoritative scriptural texts. So there's, there's something that's going on here that to my mind is a little scary. It means that theology now begins not necessarily with faith but from the perspective of a state of doubt and to escape this doubt the mind must have a motive which swings in favour of one of the alternatives destroying the power of the opposing argument uh, and acknowledging to each of the two pos positions a portion of the truth and so granting it consequential assent. I think we've still got that today, not least through social media. People take very strong opposing viewpoints rather than have that synodal consensus that working together to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. And certainly we are well and truly in the realm of the rational here. You would be right to think this diminishes the place of faith and the church thought so too, incidentally, because many of Abelard's conclusions were condemned at the Council of Sens in 1140. Around the time of theologians such as Peter Abelard, who um, many see to mark the parting of the waves between theology and spirituality, there was a shift um, in emphasis from contemplative reflection to critical analysis. Remarkably, Abelard believes that theology was in essence a deductive intellectual process gradually understood over time. And in the building up of this systematic theology, philosophical procedures, mainly inspired by Aristotle, were seen as essential and in a way competitors to a biblical understanding of things. Scripture and works from the early church fathers were regarded and used more as propositions being compared one with another in the ever dominant light of Aristotelian philosophy. And Abelard set in place ingenious systems in order to recognize distinctions and to eradicate contradiction. In this, Abelard couldn't be further from his theological predecessor Anselm and his theological opponent, Bernard of Clairvaux. Noticeably absent from Abelard's method 
his contemplative experience, something which was central to the work of St. Bernard. As neither contemplatives nor pastors, theologians of the school such as Avalard saw little value in experience. It spoke only of uncritical subjectivity and was devoid of intellectual rigour. In the monasteries, theology was the prayerful process by which experience was received, understood and expressed in the light of God's holy word. The study of the mystical life certainly required the use of reason, but this in a way quite different from that suggested by Abelard and the dialecticians. St. Bernard, the master and model of the contempor contemplative monastic method, offered a way that was less speculative and deductive. It wasn't driven by logical principles and expressed in scientific terminology. Rather, it came about through prayerful experience and was most effective when it was expressed poetically and through symbolism. This is why some designate St. Bernard as the last of the fathers of the church. Now, during this period, and if you've been able to follow uh, my thinking so far, you may see that this led to an increasing emphasis on the institutional nature of the church as opposed to any notion of the church as the people of God. The development of the papacy as head, base, foot, fountain, source of all power within the church increased as the church battled in an institutional power against the world. Through the development of scholasticism, the church was increasingly interpreted from a, a, a Christological point of view as the mystical body of Christ rather than the true body, those called into communion in the world through the Eucharist. It must be said that alongside this more speculative understanding of the church as Christ's mystical body is a strongly emphasised spirit element. And so scholastic theology consisted of a number of different elements, but with the forces of history, scholasticism begins to develop a treatise with a certain emphasis. What we notice is that a separate treatise on the church is not written in this period of scholasticism, but only came later and as a product of scholasticism and the church's defence of herself in the face of the Reformation. So we have introduced the idea of scholasticism and how the scholastics thought about things and did their theology and we, we did that um, to show that there is a difference between the way the early church fathers did theology and what is happening now. I've deliberately left to this moment a consideration of the most important scholastic, a saint of the church known as the angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas. Because you might have thought, listening to the story of scholasticism, that it was all a little torturous, uh, a, a, a little differentiated, uh, quite considerably different to what was going on with the early church fathers, and you would be right. You might also have thought there was a rather painful and unnecessary distinction between what was happening in the universities and what was happening in the monasteries, the contemplative of the monastic life versus the academic of the university life. And you would be right there too. But somehow, St. Thomas Aquinas, and he is a saint of the church, remember, brought all these things together. His great teacher was St. Albert the Great, uh, who taught in, uh, in the university in Paris. And St. Thomas, as a Dominican friar, spent most of his life actually teaching scripture rather than theology. But in his uh, Summa, he brings together all these ideas, all this uh, rich inheritance, and he creates uh, a beautiful encyclopedia of thinking about every theological aspect. 
So in that sense, St. Thomas Aquinas achieves what Abelard had tried to do and failed. He constructs a rational and scientific theology, which he considers to be very important and which influences the way we do theology today. The key then to understanding Aquinas is his adoption of an Aristotelian philosophical perspective rather than Augustine's Platonic perspective. And this means starting with experience rather than immediate intuition. This is fundamental. How do we arrive at knowledge and truth? And the answer to those questions is different with the scholastics than it was with the early church fathers. We know by looking at what God has created, the finite world. And this begins, we, this means, sorry, we begin to know with sense experience, to reach God by rational conclusion. So we've come a long way from that patristic idea of the church in heaven reflected here on earth and what St. Thomas is inviting us to do, along with the other great scholastics, was to look at the church around us, to use the senses to see what is around us. Aquinas begins then with the Aristotelian axiom, nihil est in intellectu quod non prius fuerit in sensu. There is nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses. And this leads Joseph Ratzinger to observe, of necessity then, all human knowledge must have a sensory structure. It must have its beginning in experience, in the perception of the senses. This rational experience needs a living faith. And that's something I really want to highlight. This isn't something you can do outside of the construct of a believing community or at least if it's going to produce a fruitful theological investigation. Aquinas developed a theological science that, in the words of one thinker, can only come to birth and grow to maturity within the faith. And we might sum up Aquinas' approach in two ways. First of all, the object of knowledge, even of divine things can only enter the consciousness of the subject according to the psychological laws and structures of the subject. Now, we probably take this very much for granted today, but that was something new and emerging at the time of the scholastics. And secondly, the act of knowing is rational because it uses analysis and composition to achieve knowledge and knowledge develops through the resources of sensible knowledge. There are real implications here for the work of catechesis. As Joseph Ratzinger said, every introduction to the faith must be by way of the senses. And St. Thomas Aquinas rejected any sense of dualism which may be found in Augustine. There are not two faces to the spiritual life, one facing towards God in a holy spiritual manner and the other looking at matter and therefore scientific. In short, Aquinas linked principles and conclusions. Principles are the truths of faith and revelation which theological investigation explains and develops. This truly academic view of theology is clearly different to the mystical view of Oregon and Augustine. And this led Aquinas to reject allegory and to choose the more rational analogy. This in turn led to what is known as the via negativa approach of doing things in theology. We cannot know who God is, but only what he is not. Eve Congar, another Dominican in the 20th century, sums up Aquinas in a definition of theological inquiry. He says, a rational and scientific consideration of the revealed datum, striving to procure 
for the believing human spirit a certain understanding of the datum. Now, there is always a danger that theology will be imprisoned somehow within a particular set of intellectual boundaries. And another thinker suggests that Abelard can find theology within a rationalistic cage. Personally, I would have a lot of sympathy with that notion because I think it becomes a very dangerous way for us to think about anything, and especially the church. This introduced a negative, critical spirit into an understanding of the mystery of faith. St Thomas Aquinas, on the other hand, sought to support investigation of revelation with a genuine science of the mind. And the problems for scholasticism came later. Later scholasticism began to, believe it or not, ignore the scriptures, the fountain of revelation. The 20th century Jesuit Henri de Lubac writes in Catholicism uh, that this needs to be seriously addressed. And in his work Catholicism, de Lubac explores a necessary contemporary critique of scholasticism and its dependence upon Aristotelian logic. He recognised that this dependence can easily diminish the right sense of mystery in our approach to the scriptures. If we are not careful, the dialectical method of scholasticism risks becoming an alternative authority to the scriptures. Furthermore, scholasticism began to ignore any historical sense in its pursuit of rational logic. The theology of history, which occupied so large a place in the father's thought, never found its essential groundwork in medieval thought. In effect, scholasticism began rapidly to lose touch with the original sources of the faith. It wasn't exciting and it struggled to cope with new ideas. That all seems a long time ago now, until we call to mind that 50 years ago, with a great reverence for St Thomas Aquinas, the fathers of the Second Vatican Council gathered to understand the Church and our faith in the 20th century context and came to realise that something else was needed. They called it resourcement. They called it resourcement because it was a return beyond scholasticism, taking all the good things that scholasticism has to offer, but focusing again on the scriptures and the teachings of the early church fathers. Thank you.